Alrighty, it's good to see you all. And uh, it's good to see you all again. And uh, during this week, remember that uh, we don't have class on Thursday because that is Thanksgiving. And uh, to honor that day, I have, uh, let's see what I have. Let's see what Mr. Dunn has. I have this. I got this at the local store. Stop and shop, little pumpkin ceramic uh, bowl. But it's empty, Ms. Pullman. It needs something in it, Ms. Dela Cruz. So let's see what I got. Ooh. I got candy corn. So I got that. Let me put it in the bowl. I don't think it's all going to fit in the bowl, but. And a little song to play for us. I found Adam Sandler's Thanksgiving song. Music to go with this. Tonight we start what we hope will become a weekend. So happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving from now on. A different SNL performer will compose and sing an original song to commemorate the holiday. We couldn't think of a better person to begin this tradition than our own Adam Sandler. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, I am, Kevin. I've worked all week on my song, and I hope you'll be entertained and a little move. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Stop to eat the turkey like a good boy, sure. Because it's turkey to eat. Is that good? A turkey for me, turkey for you. Let's eat turkey, it'll be brown too. Stop to eat the turkey at the table. I once saw a movie with Betty Grable. Eat that turkey all night long. Fifty million Elvis fans can't be wrong. Turkey, 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 yeah. I eat that turkey and I take on that. Thanksgiving is a special night. Jimmy Walker used to say dynamite. That's right. Turkey with the baby and the cranberry. Can't believe the men traded that was strawberry. Turkey for you and the turkey for me. Can't believe Tyson gave the girl BD. <laughs> Uh, I gobble, gobble me, I gobble, gobble doggy. I used to go to camp at Lake Away in a push doggy. Come on, Kevin. <laughs> oh, it'll be fun. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> turkey for me, and a turkey for me. Let's feed the turkey in a big round shoe. Turkey me, and a turkey for me. Turkey for me, and a turkey sweet potato pie. Sammy Davis Jr. only had one eye. Old turkey with the girls and a turkey with the boys. My favorite kind of pants. I wish her he could only cost a nickel. Oh, I love turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm going to leave it up here if anyone wants more. <laughs> All right. Okay, double effect. Yay. And cooperation. God willing, I'll get to cooperation, but I certainly have to get through double effect. Let me just see that I, I've got everybody here. Ms. Mitchell, there we are. Okay. Da -da 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 okay. Very good. So if you want more candy, it's up here. You can come up anytime and get it. Um, I sent. Uh, I will send out an email. Maybe you've noticed that uh, 
on uh, Canvas, I put up paper number three. The topic for paper number three is up on Canvas, so you can look at it. And uh, I changed the due date. It's the December 1st because I put it up late. I'm giving you an extra week, more or less an extra week to get it done. Okay, so notice the due date. All right. And if you have any questions about it, just ask me. But I will send out an email as per usual, as I've done with the previous papers, with a PDF file attached of the uh, the question. So, but it is on Canvas right now. Okie dokie. Moving along. The principle of double effect. Oh, good if I got my notes. <laughs> ah, double effect, also known as twofold effect. It's another way of describing it. Is what? It is this. The principle which sets out the conditions, sorry for it being such a long definition, the principle which sets out the conditions for when someone may perform a morally permiss permissible action that includes a foreseen, albeit unintended, bad or evil effect. Okay, so the focus here is on the effect. You have a morally permissible action, meaning that you can do it, you're able, you're permitted to do it, you're able to do it. It's something that can be done and maybe should be done, but you foresee that there is some effect from the or consequence of the action that will be bad or evil. Although, and so how do you deal with that? even though the consequence is unintended. It's foreseen, but unintended. Mr. Dietzel. According to, uh, let me make sure. That I don't, nah, I don't, I'm not there yet. According to Allison McIntyre, Maybe I should write her name on the board since I'm citing her. McIntyre. In her article on the principle, the doctrine of double effect in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the doctrine or principle of double effect is often invoked to explain the permissibility of an action that causes a serious harm as a side effect of promoting some good end. Okay, so the goal or the intention is some good, but there is a side effect which is not so good. And so how do we deal with that? According to William David Solomon in his article, Double Effect in the Encyclopedia of Ethics, it's just a quotation, I thought was a pithy quotation which explains what's going on here. Mr. Sarabo, where are you? Okay. The principle of double effect aims to provide specific guidelines for determining when it is morally permissible to perform an action in pursuit of a good end and full knowledge that the action will also bring about bad results. I think in this case, saying full knowledge is a little bit strong. Um, it's, oh, sorry, Mr. Dietzel. Yes, there's candy for Thanksgiving. Did you take some? Uh, no. Do you don't want any? Uh, no. Maybe later? Yeah, maybe. maybe not. Mr. Sarabo, candy? Happy Thanksgiving. Some candy corn? Sure. Who else came in? Oh, Miss Mitchell. Oh, Captain Miss Mitchell. Anybody else? Leave it up here. I think full knowledge is a little bit strong language there because as I said, the effect is merely foreseen and not intended. It's not that you have um, full knowledge, you know, full knowledge of the action will bring a brat, bad result, but you have maybe uh, you have a foresight that there might be a bad result from something. Sometimes you know there's going to be a bad consequence, but sometimes you might just have the idea that it's something bad is going to happen. So, nevertheless, it's it's a short, pithy explanation of what the principle is aiming at. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. The principle of double effect originated, or at least the idea, originated with someone we've heard of before, St. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages. That's Miss Reeser. Okay. 
and it originated, and this is the, uh, the quotation that it comes from, the origin of the idea. It comes from his Summa Theologiae, which we've heard of before, the summary of theology that he wrote. It comes from the, remember, there are three volumes. There's the first part, the second part, and the third part. And the second part was so long that it's divided up into two sections. So it's from the Secunda Secunde, the, uh, the second part of the, or the second section of the second volume. So that's what the two eyes mean, the double eyes. And it's question 64, Article 7. And in the context of talking about self-defense, the question is, is it always forbidden to kill? Is basically the general question that he's talking about. He's talking about the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Is it always forbidden to kill? And the response is, it's never, it's always forbidden to kill um, even if someone is trying to harm you, and he responds, no, in that case, you can, in self-defense, um, cause even deadly harm to another person. Why? Because a good action, which is defending your life, you can foresee that there are two effects. There's a good effect, which is the preservation of your life, but the, you can also foresee that there is a bad or an evil effect, which is the death, possibly the death of the aggressor. You don't have to kill the aggressor. You can neutralize the aggressor so that they're no longer causing you harm. But in the case where someone is going to kill you and is trying to kill you and you have to respond with deadly force, the bad foreseen effect is that is the death of the aggressor, which is permissible, see, provided you don't intend it. And so this is what he says. I answer that, and his answer to this question, if it's always wrong to kill. I answer that nothing hinders one act from having two effects, only one of which, namely the good effect, is intended, while the other is beside the intention. Now, moral acts take their species according to what is intended. Remember, intention can change your action. If you have an evil intention, even if you perform a good act, it can change that good act into an evil act. So intention is important in a, in a moral act. So moral acts take their species according to what is intended and not according to what is beside the intention, which you don't intend, since this is accidental. Accordingly, the act of self-defense may have two effects. One is the saving of one's life. The other is the slaying of the aggressor. Therefore, this act, since one intention is to save one's own life, is not unlawful, seeing that it is natural to everything to keep itself in being as far as possible. Okay, so this is where the idea originates, that there are double, there's a double effect. One effect that is good, one effect that is bad in a moral action. Or there can be, not always. But he developed, uh, Aquinas developed these principles to justify the use of force in defense of oneself. So it had a very limited scope, in, at least in Aquinas's original justification or, or discussion of it. But the principle, the principle was there, and the principle was then extended to other situations like just war or capital punishment and stuff like that. The idea of the principle was only systematized in its modern form by this gentleman, in case you're curious, Johannes P. Gurry, or John Gurry, is his name, in his book Compendium Theologiae Moralis, which came out in, the, in 1850 and went through subsequent editions, but the first edition came out in 1850. And, uh, you know, he's, Johannes is his Latin name. His name is John but uh, I'll keep the Latin because he wrote in Latin. And as I told you before, um, in, in olden times, in the old days, scholars, God bless you, often wrote in Latin because it was the international language. Because not everyone spoke German, not everyone spoke French or Swedish or English. So in order to communicate, the common language was us usually Latin that books were written in. And so he wrote this book in Latin, especially religious books, I should say. So the compendium, a compendium is simply a coming together, uh, how do you say a compendium? Um, could say it's also a summary, but that's not the best term that I, I would use. Um, a bringing together of all sorts of, of topics, of information on the subject of moral theology, theologiae moralis, moral theology. Theology about how the study of how you are to act.
from a religious perspective of what moral theology is. So he systematizes it and modernizes the principle um, and applies it to um, other questions that maybe Aquinas didn't have in his mind, but um, Gurry did. Sir, okay. Da -da 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 -da. The principle of double effect is historically, and well, I use this word, but how do how am I using it? Um, is is historically and of itself, it's conditioned by what we call the first principle of practical reason within the natural moral law, which is Mr. Dietzel. What is the first principle of practical reason according to the natural moral law? This was on the quiz, so I'm hoping you first know it. Principle? Yes, the first principle of practical reason. It's like what you're thinking about what you're going to do first. So it is. Like, okay. Is it jud judgments on them or no? Doing is good. You're on the right track there. We're on the right track with the doing. Let's see here. So we're on the right track. It has to do with doing because it's practical reason. So it's practice. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Ms. Reeser, the first principle of practical reason. You said it's something to do with doing? It is. Is it to do good, uh, avoid evil? Thank you, Ms. Reeser. Yes, <laughs> to do good and avoid evil. Very good. Excellent. Okay, so the principle of double effect is conditioned by that, that, that principle. Okay? And did I put that on the PowerPoint? Yes, I did. This is from an article in uh, Healthcare Ethics USA, which is the journal of the Catholic Health Association. By, it's by Peter Cataldo. The principle of double effect as preserving integral goodness, a brief historical overview. And what does he say? The reality of human action is such that this obligation is not fulfilled simply by either doing good or avoiding evil when doing so is uncomplicated. Okay, it would be nice if everything were clear cut, black and white, but you're going to run into, especially in bioethics, in the medical profession, you're going to run into a lot of gray situations. But the obligation is also enforced when the pursuit of good is inextricably tied with evil and double effect acts. Thus, a more fundamental moral goal of the PDE, the principle of double effect, this is abbreviation of the principle of double effect, is to guide the moral agent to pursue and achieve the good, that's important, to pursue, and maybe I should have highlighted that, but to pursue and achieve the good always, even though this effort is inseparably connected with evil that is foreseen as likely. So that point needs to be emphasized, doing good and avoiding evil. But how do you do that when you can foresee that there's going to be an evil consequence from something that you do? Well, this is how. <laughs> well, this, is, this is the best that we can come up with, I think, in our, in our fallen nature, our fallen state. What is it? What are the principles of the principle of double effect? There are four of them. The first principle. An action, a moral, the moral object, must be morally good or indifferent. Okay, so you cannot. I mean, that's just such, such a basic idea of the of the natural moral law that you can't commit evil even to produce good from it. Obviously, if you commit an evil act and evil effects come from it, that's obvious. It's an evil action. You know, you you should expect that there are going to be evil consequences. Um, but the action must be good or indifferent. What does it mean that it's indifferent? It means that, you know, the action, it's not that the action's bad. It's not what, it's, not what it's saying, or partly good, partly bad. It just means that the, the action doesn't really have any moral quality to it. Okay? You could do it or not do it. It's, it's not, a, a good action should always be done because it perfects us and benefits us. But you might have actions that are simply um, indifferent to, to uh, to what you're doing, there there is nothing. Um, the moral nature of it is is not is not necessarily a good or a benefit, but it doesn't harm us either. And there are actions that are like that. I'm trying to think of one. I should have thought of a uh, of a good example, but I didn't think of one, so I apologize for that. Now, 
Not maybe something will come to me. As with any human act, the moral nature of a double effect act is taken from its moral object. If I write this on, or draw this on the board, you have obviously the action. So you have the moral, the three parts of an action, which are the moral object. Number one, you have two, which is the intention, or the intent, and you have three, which are the circumstances. All right, and then from this moral action, out of here, we have two effects. One is a good effect, and one is an evil effect or a bad effect. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll do it like that. So obviously, the moral nature of a double effect act is derived from its object. If the object is intrinsically evil, something that should never be done at any time, then clearly it should not be done in the first, first instance, no matter what effect is achieved. The moral object of the act, as I said, must be good or at least not intrinsically immoral. And so the object or the means of the act shouldn't be against God or against yourself or against a neighbor. It can't be against the good. The second principle is that the good effect or a good effect cannot come from an evil effect. Okay, so you see this on the board as I've drawn it, and uh, better. Thought maybe I did, but I didn't say no. I have more, more markers. I guess I only had the one marker. Huh. That's interesting. I wore it home. Okay, I well, gotta make do with what I got. Unless, no, that's uh, nope. So the good effect cannot be generated or created by the evil effect. No good can come from evil. The good effect must come from the good act itself. It comes from the goodness of the action itself. So you have this split here. You don't have a good effect and then branching off the, or, or the good effect can't be branching off from the evil one. Like I create, I have an evil effect, but a good, some good comes from this evil effect. That's, that's invalid. That would invalidate the principle. The good effect must follow immediately from the action must follow immediately from the action and not somewhere down the line, okay? The third principle, I'm going to pause because I could have sworn that I had more in my bag, is that the good effect must be intended or willed, while the evil effect is not intended or willed, it's foreseen and tolerated. So there's a difference here. The good effect itself, you must intend the good effect from the good action or the indifferent action, but the bad effect is simply foreseen. It's for means before, in front of. So you can predict that there's probably going to be some evil effect or bad outcome to the action that is not intended, but rather is tolerated. And what does that mean? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Foresight. I have a definition for force. Oh, I have a definition for foresight. Um, I don't want to do that. Well, let me go to the fourth condition, and then I'll I'll backtrack to the third condition because I have the definition for foresight on the PowerPoint. The fourth condition is that the good effect must be of greater or equal importance to the evil effect. So the evil cannot outweigh the good in the action that's being that's being performed. The good effect must be either equal to the evil effect or greater than the evil effect in its proportionate goodness or its proportionate benefit to whatever the person is doing.
Oh, I guess I'll come back. I will come back to that. Okay. No, that's fine. I just repeat the uh, the principles because I think I was going to talk about them, but I already talked about them, so I'll move on. Two effect. Here we go. Three effect. Here we go. Foresight and to tolerate. The definition of foresight is the ability or the power to have knowledge of something before it happens. So see, seeing before, seeing something happen before, before it occurs. According to Peter Cataldo in his article that I already referenced for you, the principle of the double effect as preserving integral goodness in Healthcare Ethics USA, the intention, intention should not be conflated with insight. And this sometimes happens, I think, in uh, people who write about the principle of double effect and they raise objections to it and say it doesn't make sense in some cases. Um, but when I read what they're writing, it seems like they are confusing intention with foresight. Foresight is not the same thing as intending something. Okay, Traditionally, foresight and intention were regarded as operations of two different powers. Intention is an act of the will to choose to do something, to intend to do something. Foresight, however, is an act of the intellect. So they're two different things. They're not, they're related, they're interrelated because intellect and will are interrelated in us, um, under our understanding and our ability to choose. But to foresee something is, is something in my intellect, my understanding, I can foresee it. It doesn't mean I choose it necessarily. I may choose to choose it, but that's a possibility. It's not the actuality. So you don't want to confuse foresight with intention. To foresee a bad consequence in the double effect is not necessarily to intend it. And foreseeing the bad effect does not disrupt the integrity of the action, the moral object, because foreseeing a consequence does not necessarily entail that the effect is intended. It's, it's separate in a way from the moral object, the moral action of what you're doing. So it still has its integrity. There's an integrity to the moral act. Uh, do I see that? Toleration means to endure something, to, to to put up with. Okay, without prohibition, without prohibi prohibiting it, or interfering with it, or contradicting it. Um, if you can, of course, in some way prohibit or interfere with an evil effect, then go for it. You know, that you should want to do that. You shouldn't want an evil effect to, to occur. You should want only good effects to occur. But in some cases, just in the world we live in, it's simply not possible. So you endure it. And that's what toleration means. So there's a, a difference between enduring the effect you, which means you in, implies that you don't want it to occur. You don't intend it, but you're going to endure it for the sake of a proportionately greater good. Here we come to four, where the, the effect must be greater or equal. Proportionate, this word proportionate, comes from a Latin expression, proportione, which means in the degree proper to something, in the degree that it should be with something. Um, or to the degree. So to the degree, or in proportion to the degree that the, that proportion to the to the uh, the good that would be produced, it can be permissible. So proportionate, the state or quality of one part being in relation to another or to the whole with respect to magnitude its greatness, you know, its size, its quantity, or its degree. I guess I could have put size instead of magnitude. I probably should have. But, um, you know, how thing relates to other things in comparison to size, to quantity, how much there is, or to degree, the intensity of something. All right. The good effect must be proportionate to the bad effect, and proportionately better to the bad effect. In a sense, you say there must be more good created from the good effect, or at least equal to the bad effect for it to be for it to be permissible. It must be sufficient. There must be sufficient reason to permit the evil consequence that's going to happen. And remember, you're not acting the consequence. It's not part of your action. It's a consequence. It comes from your action. So that's another distinction to keep in mind. You're not to blame for the consequence. 
unless you intend the consequence. In this case, the evil effect is not, not intended, but merely tolerated. According to Alison McIntyre in her article, Doctrine of Double Effect for Stanford Encyclopedia, which I already mentioned before, but I've got her here again, she says the proportionality condition is usually understood to involve determining if the extent of the harm is adequately offset by the magnitude of the proposed benefit. So there's an, she puts it in the, in the, uh, in the, in the words of or in the idea of an offset. Okay, the good offsets the bad. Um, again, that's that's a way to put it. I'm not sure if I would put it necessarily that way. Um, it's not that the good is necessarily offsetting the bad, kind of like a yin and yang thing, two sides of the same coin. Um, you know, it, bad is bad. You shouldn't want the bad. You should want to minimize the bad as much as possible, Ms. Reeser. Yeah. You should want to <laughs> actuate the good as much as possible. So it's not it's not necessarily a question of offsetting the good from the bad, but making sure that the good, which is what is wanted, should should be as much as possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. Let's see if I put that in the PowerPoint. Yes, I did. Good. According to John McHugh and Charles Callan in their book, Moral Theology, a complete course based on St. Thomas Aquinas and the best modern authorities, which you can see came out in 1958, two volumes. When you're talking about proportionality, um, there are some things to consider. An agent, um, an agent must have a sufficiently weighty reason for permitting an evil result. Evil is never a good thing to try to, to, um, to generate. You, you want to avoid it as much as possible. You have to be careful with it. Because, of course, it hurts people. It hurts, you can hurt yourself, but it can hurt other people. It can harm your relationship with God. Evil should not even be permitted unless there is adequate compensation in the good that is intended. It's not enough to merely permit or tolerate an evil effect. R rather, allowing or tolerating an evil effect must be proportionately grave, serious, to do that. And so you have to consider certain things. You have to consider the level of dependence of an evil effect on the act. In other words, how much of the evil effect is coming from the moral act that you're performing? Okay. Um, you know, if you tell someone the truth, which is a good action, the moral object is good, but the ev there's an evil effect in the sense that the truth may also cause a misunderstanding. So you, you have a good effect, which is you're telling, well, the moral object is good, you're telling the truth, um, or you're telling someone the information, and the good effect is that it's true, that you're, whatever, you're giving the person, well, I guess that would be the good effect, that you're giving them information, but there might be a foreseen evil effect that the truth-telling that you're doing might cause misunderstanding among some people or some a person. How, you know, how direct is that misunderstanding going to be? Maybe not so much, okay? You can't control what people are going to hear when you tell the truth. But in, let's say, the moral object is you are defending your life, and the evil effect is that has to be tolerated is that you, you're going to have to kill the person who's the aggressor. The person is just coming at you and coming at you. And, you know, the, the good effect will be that you save your life and you preserve your life, but you can foresee that you're going to have to kill this person who's trying to kill you. Say it's in a situation of war. Okay, you're in a state of war and you see the enemy and the enemy sees you and he raises his gun and you know that he's going to shoot you and kill you. So you have to shoot first, hopefully. And you foresee that, but you don't intend it. That's maybe a little, but then when you think about the proportionate harm of the evil effect, that is 
more direct than, say, people misunderstanding something you say when you're telling the truth. Okay? Killing is more direct. Having to kill the other person is a more direct evil effect. It, it depends more, I would say, on the action than, say, you just tell, say something and people understand it and, and take benefit from it, but other people can take um, another meaning from it and be offended. Proportionately, you also have to consider how nearly or certain it is that the evil effect will follow. If I tell someone the truth, well, other people might not over, other people who might understand might not hear me. It might not follow immediately from, it might not follow immediately as an effect from what I do. The effect is not near, or it's not certain that people will misunderstand me. Whereas if I point my gun at the enemy in a war and shoot at him or her, it is more likely, it is nearer to the possibility that I will cause harm, perhaps fatal harm, to that person. The effect, the evil effect that will follow, which is the taking of another human being's life, will follow more, more directly and more certainly from that action. So that goes into considering the proportion of good to evil. One's personal obligation to prevent the evil effect. Um, someone who is... Uh, in a position of authority, um, person who is in government or a religious leader, a priest, a rabbi, someone like that, are under a greater obligation proportionately to prevent an evil effect than to not, than say me. Okay, I mean, I, of course, I, I just should normally want to prevent an evil effect, but someone who knows better, basically, it's saying someone who knows better or is in a position to better prevent an evil, evil effect um, should, you know, should, is under a greater obligation to, proportionately to justify the presence of the evil effect because a legislator can write a law a certain way and they can try to negotiate, and that's what they do try to do and negotiate, try to negotiate that the effects of a law will not harm anybody, that there will only be good and benefits coming from, say, a law that is passed. But if there are going to be disbenefits or, or lack of value, they try to mitigate that as much as possible, and they're obligated to do that as leaders in the government. A religious leader is obligated to do that because he or she should know the moral law. They're leaders. They're influencers. Their, their opinions have influence, so they shouldn't lead people into doing things that will cause evil. They should want to try to mitigate that as much as possible. So, so when we talk about proportionality, there's more to it than just saying, okay, there's more good than, than there's bad. Okay, you also have to look at the evil effect and see and try as much as possible to mitigate its influence coming from the action as much as possible. This principle of double effect applies as a whole. According to Peter Cataldo, again, and the principle of double effect as preserving integral goodness, he says, did I, put that on? I did. In the Catholic moral tradition, each condition represents an integral part of the whole. Okay, integral comes from two Latin words, means touching together. So everything is touching, everything is connected. So it's complete in a way. Everything's kind of connected and touching itself. So each condition represents an integral part of a whole. All four conditions must be fulfilled and must be applied with the appropriate virtues for a double effect act to be justified. Okay, so kind of like a moral action in the principle of plenitude, that all parts of an action, for an action to be good, all parts of an action should be good. Same thing with the principle of double effect. For an action to be permissible under double effect, all four of the components must be there. It must be a good action. Um, the, the good effect cannot proceed, must proceed from the action and not proceed from the evil effect. The, uh, you can't intend the evil effect. It must just be foreseen. You must intend the good effect. And there must be a proportionate reason, a proportionately serious reason for allowing the evil effect um, to even exist. Those all should go together. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. Break time. Okay. 
Let's have an example. Hysterectomy. Mm, mm, mm. I know it's just sugar and coloring, but it just tastes so good, Mr. Cruz. You know what I'm saying? No? <laughs> sugar and I think syrup and you know. ah. Mm. What is a hysterectomy? It's a medical term made up of two Greek words. The first one is hystera which means the womb, the uterus in Greek, and an ectomy, which means to cut something out in Greek. So to cut some, whatever, you cut something out, an appendectomy, you cut out the appendix, tonsillectomy, you cut out the tonsils. In this case, we're cutting out, possibly cutting out part or all of a woman's uterus. So it's a hysterectomy. Mary is four months pregnant. It is, however, discovered that she has endometrial cancer of the uterus. The endometrium, if I remember correctly, is this inner lining of a woman's uterus, usually where, uh, usually it should be, where the embryo will attach itself and grow. And she's developed a cancerous tumor in the endometrium. The treatment options are abortion, or a hysterectomy. Those are pretty much the only two options. Um, you, can, uh, you can abort the fetus and then treat the cancer, or you can do a hysterectomy, which would be in the, the surgical removal of the woman's, of her uterus. Con circumstances, that Mary is a Catholic, so she, abortion is not an option for her. So the only other option medically available for her would be a hysterectomy. In the first option of abortion, abortion would directly damage and kill the life of the fetus for its removal. I mean, you, you have to. You just you can't you, you can't you know take it out alive. I mean, you can with, with if you suction it out. But if the if it's four months pregnant, the child is the fetus is larger, then you you can't you can't just do that. You have to dismember it and remove it, which obviously means directly ending the life of whatever is alive there in the, in the uterus. So abortion will directly damage and kill the life of the fetus in order to, for the cancer to then be treated, which is a good effect. So the cancer being treated is a good effect. The death of the fetus is a bad effect. The problem is the moral object, from, at least from a Catholic point of view, from Catholic moral ethics and Catholic bioethics, uh, and, and even from other bioethics. You know, there are atheists who are against abortion as well. It doesn't mean, so that might be a problem if you're directly willing to end the life of another human being. That can go against the natural law, which is the essential preservation of life. It can go against the principle, the dignity of the human person, if you believe it is a human person, um, which is accorded rights, one of those rights being to exist, to be alive. So abortion is, if, if you look at it that way, as killing a human being in its moral object, no matter what the intention is of the circumstances, is already um, might be out of bounds. And let's say in the case of Mary, say she's a pro-life woman, it is already out of bounds for her, so... The moral object, so in conscience, she couldn't go against her conscience as well. She would be obligated to act on it. So the moral object is not good. Whatever the consequences are. What about the other option of a hysterectomy? For a hysterectomy, removing her uterus with the fetus still in it, because obviously it still has to have the fetus still in it because you're not aborting the fetus. Um, you're removing the, the diseased uterus. Um, so removing the uterus with the fetus still in it will have the consequence of the death of the fetus. So there is a, a bad effect. The removal of a diseased organ is, as a moral object, is a good thing. It's not, it's doing good to the mother, to, to Mary, who has the cancerous tumor in her uterus. 
So the moral object is fine. You're, you're treating a disease, and the good effect will be the saving of the life of the mother of Mary, um, who is pregnant. But the bad effect that you can foresee happening from this is just the way it is. You have to remove the whole a por a portion of the uterus with the fetus in it, or the whole uterus with the fetus in it. The consequence is going to be the death of the fetus. Not removing the uterus will have the consequence of both the death of the mother and the child. So the death of both. What are the principles that are involved? What principles are involved? Yes. Well, first of all, we have the natural law's first principle of practical reason, which is to do good and avoid evil. So all of their, their, their clearly actions that are being performed that are good, um, and there are some things that are happening that are evil that we don't want. I mean, whatever someone thinks about abortion, no one wants the death of a human life. Um, uh, whatever. I mean, it's not seen as necessarily a good thing. So do good and avoid evil. We have the principle of the greatest commandment, which is love of God and love of neighbor. So we love God by following his law and trying to do what is his will for us. But we also love our neighbor. In this case, um, the neighbor is for the doctor. The neighbor is the mother who is suffering. In the case of the mother, it's also the child that she has, presuming that it's a wanted child, the child that she has and she cares for and doesn't want to lose. From Revelation, we have the Ten Commandments, when the Fifth Commandment is clear. Well, I shouldn't say it's clear, not totally clear, but um, you shall not kill. And I say it's clear because it doesn't mean, doesn't mean murder or kill, you know, which are two different things. But you, know, you shall not kill. You shall not take an innocent human life. So we have the, um, which we have the, uh, the witness of the Bible, which is basically stating something from the natural law. I mean, you don't necessarily have to be a religious person to understand that you don't kill the innocent. You don't need a God necessarily to tell you that. Human societies have recognized that, recognized that long before it was written down in the Bible. But you also have the principle of the human person made in the image and likeness of God. So the human person deserves ultimate respect. And the first, according to the natural law, the first inclination of human nature is to preserve life, to want to be alive, to want to exist. So in the case of, again, the medical option of abortion, the direct killing of the fetus is certainly not a good or a benefit to the fetus, because the fetus is going to die. And that's the intention, to kill the fetus, to remove it, and then later to treat, to treat, the, um, to treat the woman. So you have a bad, you, even the evil consequence, which is the death of the fetus, comes before the good consequence and is more directly related to the action. It violates the respect for the sanctity of human life, which we've talked about, by directly intending to kill an innocent, which would be in this case be the fetus. So as such, abortion, at least from Catholic bioethics, is not an option for the double effect since its moral object is evil. But what about the hysterectomy? Do we have some direction here? Well, we do. In the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services, the ERD, which we've talked about before, um, which deals with bioethical questions, in um, directive number 47, it, ta it says, operations, treatments, and medications that have as their direct purpose the cure of a proportionately serious pathological condition of a pregnant woman are permitted when they cannot be safely postponed until the unborn ch child is viable, even if they will result in the death of the unborn child. Provided, of course, you're not directly intending to kill the unborn child. So if the moral object is to treat a serious pathological condition, a diseased uterus, then the action is good. The, remo the removal of the uterus will remove the cancerous tumor and the woman will be safe. Mary will be safe. So the action has a good effect of treating a serious pathological con condition which affects healing. However, 
it has the bad effect of leading indirectly to the death of the fetus, which is within the removed uterus. But the fetus's death, what's the difference? That the fetus's death, the bad effect, the evil effect that comes, does not derive directly from the good effect, the healing procedure. Okay, the removal of a diseased organ is a good, the moral object is good, so that's fine. We're talking here about the effects that will come from that, the consequences. The evil effect does not follow from the consequence. The good consequence is the healing of the pathology. Okay, the, treat, the treating of the cancer. Oh, oh, it's an extreme treatment, but that's what you have to do. I mean, you can, you could give radiation therapy to the, to the, the another option would be to give radiation therapy or chemotherapy to the mother with the fetus there, but that would, again, kill the fetus. And it would be more direct action on the fetus. You, the evil effect would be more direct to the fetus. You would know that you're irradiating the fetus and it's going to die, you know. Um, so the hysterectomy is an extreme, uh, extreme uh, solution, but it might be the best solution. So the good effect, but the evil effect of the death of the fetus doesn't come directly from the good effect which is healing. It comes from the action, which is a good one, which is the removal of a diseased organ. So the bad effect doesn't derive directly from the good effect, and the removal of the uterus is not intended to directly kill the fetus, so direct purpose. The removal of the uterus's direct intention is to heal the pathology, to bring up, to remove the cancer and heal the pathology within Mary within the woman, the mother. So the, it's not intended directly to kill a fetus, but to remove the diseased uterus. The bad effect, obviously, because you know the fetus is in there, the bad effect is obviously foreseen, because what can you do? I mean, it would be nice if it were possible to remove the fetus, and uh, if, if, you know, if it's not viable, but if there were some way to take care of it, um, so that it, became, it will become viable, but that's just not technologically possible at this point in time. But so you're dealing with what you know, you're dealing with the cards you dealt basically, and trying to do the morally correct thing. So the bad effect is obviously foreseen, but it's not intended or willed. The surgeon would save the life of the fetus if it were possible, but it's just not possible under these circumstances. So that's a difference. There's a difference between. You're directly intending to kill the fetus to remove it, and you're not going to save its. You're not going to save its life. In the case of removing the, the uterus with the fetus in it, you would save the uterus if possible, but it's not possible in this situation. You, your, um, your primary goal is to is the healing of the woman. The value of keeping the fetus's life alive is not proportionate to the life of the mother. So now we're talking about proportionality because, yeah, and there are a bunch of questions that go into here. You know, one is the fact that the, the woman is use, losing her uterus, so she's u losing her fertility. She won't be able to have any more children. So that's part of the consideration of the proportionate value of removing the uterus. Um, then also the fact that this is that you're losing the life of the fetus. Are those two things proportion? Are those two evils proportionately greater than the good effect? Proportionately, um, possibly not. The value of keeping the fetus's life alive is not proportionate to the life of the mother, who is living and whose life can be saved. The fetus's life cannot be saved under any circumstance, especially if it's not viable. If it's not viable. You can't take it out and put it in an incubator. I mean, if you take it out, it's going to die regardless. If you leave it there, it's going to die because of the cancerous tumor. So death is the ultimate, the ultimate uh, um, scenario for the fetus anyways, where it's not for the mother when we're thinking about proportionality. The fetus will likely die if the cancer is left untreated, and it can't be saved. So, oh, yes, go ahead, sir. How do, how do we decide, like... Who decides which one is more, like in, in a case where a doctor is deciding, right? Like, how do you know which moral side to take in a situation like that? Well, who's going to be acted on? The mother, I guess. Yeah. 
the patient. Yeah. The patient is the in, in any in any procedure, medical procedure. You, if you're the patient, you're the one who has to receive the medical treatment. So, because we talked about this with paternalism, you know, where doctors could choose that they were going to treat the patient in a certain manner and, and give them uh, treatment, even regardless of their their um, their wishes, and that's been done in the past, um, but not today. Not shouldn't be. Um, but yeah, it would be the mother. It would be Mary, who hypothetical Mary who has to make that decision in conscience is her life proportion is preserving her life proportionately better than the life of the fetus, which is going to die anyways, just given the situation can't be saved. So it's going to, you know, you can't remove it if it's not viable. So if it is viable, that chain might change the ball game. Then you can remove it and, you know, you, you put it into an incubator and you can save, um, children that and babies that have been have been born at very young ages still in developmental stages within the uterus but they we have the technology but let's say it's it's early enough in the pregnancy where there's just the tech even with technology the fetus is just too undeveloped to survive so it's going to die and it's going to die if you leave it there because the cancer is going to kill the cancer is going to grow and impinge on it and um it is possible that the mother could say in conscience that let me wait for treatment on the cancer and let the child be born as soon as possible, as soon as it's viable, and then then treat the cancer. And maybe that way you can save both. You know, you wait until you might have to do a cesarean or something, but you um, but you'd wait until that abs that moment when the the fetus is definitely viable can live outside the mother's body. So you take it out and then you immediately start immediately as soon as possible start treating the cancer and that might save the mother's life as well that could be a decision that could be kind of split the difference i guess you would say but yeah it would be the person acted on that's the person who has to make the decision um what comes in with the doctor and this is why i talk with cooperation is the doctor has to cooperate with that decision has to make the decision that okay you know i'm i'm on board with this and i think it's also a moral thing to do that's where cooperation comes in okie dokie so uh i shouldn't be so bouncy talking about people dying <laughs> sorry about that anyways um so a hysterectomy would be morally permissible would be bioethically permissible since Removing the diseased organ is a good act. The removal does not directly cause the fetus's death. The fetus's death, although foreseen, is not intended. And the pre preservation of life is gr sufficiently greater than the death of both lives. And we could also throw in the fertility. The loss of fertility is also something that the woman can live with in the preservation of her own life. Now, for your paper, you're going to talk about ectopic pregnancy. Let's go talk about this for one second because it might help you with doing the paper because you're going to apply these principles to ectopic pregnancy. And I describe it in there. But I describe it, but I'll just tell it to you. Um, you know, you've got the uterus here. And you've got the fallopian, we're called the fallopian tubes. And you've got the ovaries. You know, and the egg is passed over to the fallopian tube and stuff like that, and the egg is fertilized. Well, sometimes what happens is that the egg will not make it, the fertilized ovum, um, the embryo, will not make it all the way to the uterus to implant. Whoa. Uh, I was barely close to it. It's very sensitive. I need a pointer. That the, it will not make it all the way, and what often happens is that a fertilized ovum, an embryo, will get stuck in the fallopian tube. It will start Mr. Thatch to grow in the full of the wall of the fallopian tube, which is not a good thing. That's not where a baby is supposed to grow. Okay, ectopic comes from two Greek words. This is ex and topos. X means out of, and topos means place. So literally, an out-of-place pregnancy. 
So what do you do? Well, there are three treatments, or excuse me, four treatments that I give you, four standard treatments. You can leave it alone, which is expected management. You can leave it alone in, in uh, quite a number of cases. Uh, it will resolve itself. The, the body will recognize that this is not a good thing and it will cause the miscarriage of the embryo, um, which will cause the death of the embryo, but it's perfectly natural and it's, it's not intended by anybody, so there's no moral problem. You haven't done anything to the embryo. So it's not a moral problem for the person. Um, you can uh, you can remove the the embryo from the fallopian tube. You cut a little slit into the fallopian tube. Sur this requires surgery, and you kind of scoop out the embryo, which obviously is going to kill the embryo. That's a salpingostomy. Salpingo means uh, the fallopian tube. It's another word. It's uh, I'm presuming it's from Latin. So if you say salpingo in front of anything, it means the fallopian tube, usually, or a tube. Um, or you can remove the whole fallopian tube with the embryo in it, salpingectomy, um, which might be morally better because it's kind of like a hysterectomy in the sense that, the, yes, the embryo inside of it will eventually die, but it's not the intended reason you're doing it. You're trying to remove the disease um, tube. Uh, and then you have a drug you can administer called methotrexate, which attacks the embryo. It attacks the, the cells of the embryo so that they will kind of stop dividing, will kind of detach itself, and will be expelled. And, of course, that, that directly causes the death. Well, I shouldn't say directly, but it certainly causes the, directly causes the detachment of the embryo and can mess up the cells. Um, which is methotrexate is dangerous because it can also cause birth defects. Um, so it directly attacks the embryo and will cause the death of the embryo. So that might be a moral issue if it's too direct. Uh, and, the, and I should tell you that all of these options are up for debate, even by Catholic bioethicists. There's some, you know, there there are some that, um, uh, or there, there's debate on, on the issue of, of what to do in an ectopic pregnancy. So I give it to you. I'm not expecting you to. I'm not expecting you to arrive at a definitive solution because if bioethicists themselves, where this is their bread and butter, this is what they they earn their bones on, if they disagree, I'm not expecting you to like figure it all out. But I'm expecting you to think about it and apply the principle of double effect to each of these possibilities. Oh, it did that to me again? You know what are you doing to me? There we go. Ethical cooperation. To cooperate means to act or associate with another in the achievement of some goal. To literally work together. That's exactly uh, work together. Thank you. Excuse me, backspace. There we go. Cum means with and opero means to work. So the cooperation is working together. Oh, come on. When it is, when the cooperation addresses when it's acceptable to cooperate in immoral actions. This does not mean one is permitted to perform or be part of a moral activity, but it addresses when one may perform a permissible action, even though it's connected in some way to an evil one. And there are two types of cooperation. Mm -hmm. you got to be kidding me. There are two types of cooperation, formal cooperation and material cooperation. And as you can see, material cooperation is divided into proximate material cooperation and remote material cooperation. What, is the, what do these mean? <laughs> formal cooperation means you will the act or you share in it. Okay, so you 
fully cooperate, you formally cooperate, you sign the form in a way, you say, okay, I'm signing off on this. You are willing the evil action and your end or you're sharing in it, you're intending to share in it. So an example of formal cooperation would be that a person pays a hitman to kill his spouse. He doesn't kill his spouse, the hitman kills his spouse, but he is formally cooperating because he's paying the guy to do it. Or a person drives a getaway car for a bank robber. Bank robber. The person didn't, didn't directly go into the bank to steal the money, to rob the bank, but he's driving the car. So he is formally cooperating by certainly willing in the act, certainly sharing in the action. Material cooperation is the performance of a licit act, a permissible act, which assists in the commission of an evil act. And it can be proximate or re remote. So, approximate, it, it, you're not, this means you're not sharing or willing the evil action, but something that you're doing tends to facilitate an evil action, whether you intend it or not. So, in the case of, and it can be close to you or it can be far away. So, approximate material cooperation and evil will be I loan a gun to somebody who I know is unstable and likely to cause harm. I'm not willing that they cause people harm, and I'm not sharing in the action necessarily, although you might say I am by giving them the gun, but I'm just, you know, loaning a person something, an object, God bless you. But it's close enough materially that I could be to blame. I'm co it's a close cooperation. I'm giving the person the, the means to cause harm. Remote cooperation would be like someone who distributes, uh, you know, a, a beer distributor who brings beer to a bar. That's his job. He brings beer to a bar where it's likely someone will abuse alcohol, someone will get drunk. You can't control what these other people are going to do. So it's remote. You're remote. You're far enough removed from the actions of other people that it's remote material cooperation and what could be an evil, which is not drinking alcohol, but getting drunk. Formal cooperation can never be done. A person, because you're participating and willing in the evil action. Material cooperation, you can sometimes do. Depends on the circumstance, and there has to be a proportionate reason for doing it. There has to be a sufficient reason for performing a permissible action in furtherance of an evil action. So, for example, and this is kind of borderline, but anyways, a nurse at a hospital who has to, who, who's pro-life and believes abortion is, is not pr uh, proper, is an immoral action, not a proper action to perform, and yet as part of his or her job, has to wash the utensils that have been used in an abortive procedure. They're cooperating with an evil action, what they believe to be an evil action in conscience, but it's material cooperation. They're not willing it or sharing in it. Is it material proximate? Is it close enough to the action? Maybe it's proximate. And that's why I say it's borderline. It could still be something not to be done if it bothers um, the nurse's conscience enough, but it could also be something that could be done. A clearer case is saying a nurse who has to take care of a woman who's had an abortion, who's come to the hospital, has, has had an abortive procedure, and then needs post-operative care, post, you know, po after the uh, care after the, op after the procedure. That's, you know, I would say definitely material cooperation and probably remote enough that the nurse would not have to have a conscientious problem about it. <laughs> This idea of cooperation, just to give you another example, whoops, I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Eh. Came up with the COVID vaccines. Why? Well, because the in in, in, in the formation of vaccines, a lot of vaccines, they use um, material from aborted fetuses in the design, development, and product, production and testing of these vaccines. And this has been going on since like the 60s. So, um, you know, it's hard to get away from when you're dealing with vaccines, even if you're someone who's pro-life or against abortion, don't, don't want to cooperate with it. However, 
The question is, is your cooperation formal? No, because you didn't participate in the abortion to begin with the, that benefits in the, from the back or provides a benefit through the vaccine. So it's not directly willing in the, willing the act or sharing in it. So it's not formal. So the question is, it's material, but how material is the cooperation? Is it proximate or remote? The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Doctrine and its Committee on Pro-Life Activities issued a statement in 2020 called the Moral Considerations Regarding the New COVID-19 Vaccines to give some direction on this. And it went over this issue and pointed out that um, my, uh, you know, Moderna and Pfizer, which you see up there, and using their in using or uh, producing their vaccines, they only used aborted fetal material in the testing of the vaccine, but not in the design, development, or production. Whereas AstraZeneca, which is on the bottom there, used aborted fetuses in the or material from aborted fetuses all throughout the, the design, the development, production, and testing. So the cooperation in the case of Moderna and Pfizer is suitably remote. So it's less, in the case of AstraZeneca, it's not. So that would be something that a Catholic could take into consideration. If you could opt for a Moderna vaccine or a Pfizer vaccine, then you could. But if there's a proportionate reason, meaning the health of you or the health of your child, so you don't get COVID and die because it, it, it can be a deadly illness, that might be proportionately seri a serious enough reason even to take to AstraZeneca. Because again, we're talking here about material cooperation, and it's probably remote enough from the production of how the vaccine was created that it's not it's morally permissible, even though it's kind of tainted in a way. You don't want it to be this way, but you have basically you have no control over the ethical actions that were um, that were committed by the company, by the corporation, in producing it. So that's cooperation, and that's it. So uh, have a good Thanksgiving. I'll see you all next week. God bless you all. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving to everyone who is watching.